In the late 40s, he gave the tough job of designing the world's first jet airliner to Ronald Bishop, the man behind the brilliant de Havilland Mosquito Bomber, one of Britain's most vital wartime aircraft. Bishop's next challenge was to design an aircraft that would fly higher, faster and further than the best piston-engine propeller-driven airliners ever built. And this is a development model of what went on to become the Comet. The Comet, like the Vulcan a few years later, would use jet engines buried in the wing roots, flying at high altitude where reduced drag from the thin air improved speed and fuel economy. But in such thin air, passengers wouldn't be able to breathe, and it would be rather cold. Bishop wanted his passengers to have a luxury experience, flying in comfort with unrivaled views through large square windows. But you could hardly expect them to wear heated military-style flight suits and oxygen masks. So the Comet would be built with a pressurized cabin. But that was a tough engineering challenge. The airliner is like a reverse submarine. Go too deep in a submarine and you could be crushed. Go too high in a pressurized aeroplane and you could explode. At the intended 40,000 feet altitude, the comet's lightweight aluminium skin will be stretched from the inside like a giant balloon. So Bishop had to design an aircraft strong enough to withstand the pressure, yet light enough to reach high altitude with the power that was available. The ghost engines Bishop had at his disposal each produced about 5,000 pounds of thrust, 50% more than rival piston engines, but only 10% of the thrust of a modern jumbo jet. The Comet, with these engines, would struggle to reach its target cruising altitude of 40,000 feet. So the fuselage skin was made as thin as was considered safe. The Comet's design was a careful balance between power, weight, strength and safety. It would be flying in a realm that was untested and unknown to passenger aircraft. But, contrary to popular myth, the Comet was extremely thoroughly tested before its maiden commercial flight. The 2nd of May, 1952. Worldwide success and vast potential profits all hung on this first flight. 36 paying passengers boarded Comet callsign Yoke Peter at London Airport, now known as Heathrow. London Tower, this is Yoke Peter requesting permission for takeoff. Over. Ah, Yoke Peter, you're clear for takeoff. Over. Just after 3 p.m., Comet Yoke Peter took off from London Heathrow bound for Johannesburg. Tickets cost £315 return, the same as for the less luxurious, slower piston-engined airliners. This is your captain speaking, ladies and gentlemen. We're now cruising at a speed of 500 miles an hour at an altitude of 40,000 feet. Beat that piston-engined aircraft. The jet age had begun, with Britain at the helm. Over the next two glorious years, airlines from around the globe placed orders for the Comet. A triumph for de Havilland and Britain on an international scale. American Aviation magazine went so far as to say, whether we like it or not, the British are giving the US a drubbing in jet transport. <laughs> 